Yeah, hello everybody. Um, thanks for presenting us. We're um, Johannes, I'm Johannes, and this is my colleague Thilo, and we're gonna present to you our project of open geofiction. Um, it's actually about drawing a collaborative fictional world using the OpenStreetMap software. So um, this is what we're gonna do. Um, F5. Okay, just a short overview of what we're uh, gonna tell you. It's um, a short introduction of why actually making fictional maps. Um, then in the second part, we talk about our history, or so to say, our personal approach and geofictional evolution. And then the third, and of course, the most important part is um, about the open geofiction project itself. Um, it's a detailed description and some technical issues. That said, I'm gonna start with the first uh, part. Why fictional maps? I think uh, all of you know that maps are fascinating and uh, making maps is actually like telling a story. And if you compare to all other kind of literary work, any map mapping can map making can be based upon existing places or like a novel that's telling a story about places that don't exist, also a map can tell a story about a fictional place. So this is the interest in making fictional maps. Um, it's like telling a story about fictional places but in a geographical way. And then a short notice about the word geofiction. Um, there are some definitions um, that are sli slightly different, but in our mind or in our definition, it's creating maps of fictional places, but in a realistic environment. That means that um, we are not like, for example, like Tolkien with, it, uh, with his Middle Earth, uh, where you have the fictional map, but you also have some um, fictional circumstances or uh, fictional physical laws which exist in this environment. We produce a realistic environment, but with fictional places. So um, this is our general interest in making fictional maps. Here you can see some examples of um, maps of not existing places. It's the Mid Middle Earth map uh, on the left, then in the middle you have um, the Gotham City map, one other example, and then you have a small map of Westeros of the Game of Thrones. This is just three examples of what it could look like or can look like when you have fictional maps. Um, so how was it in our personal um, history and evolution? Um, both of us started making uh, fictional maps quite early. Um, already as a child, I, for example, made um, fictional maps of, of different places and at different scales. Later in the teenage period, I started um, drawing maps hand-drawn maps, um, which were supposed to look like printed maps, like printed city maps in scales of 1 to 15,000 up to 1 to 25,000. So this is an example of what this type of map looked like. Everything still hand-drawn, but then later, um, the project, the project um, developed. Here's one example of a city that I made from the years of 2000 until 2007, with long breaks in between, but uh, finally in 2007 the map was ready. And it's in this case, you can see here um, a hand-drawn base layer, but with some computer-generated stuff on top of it. Um, then there was the next step of um, going over to um, making maps with vector-based um, software. And at first in the 1990s, 1990s I had many ob obstacles um, doing this. I mean, if you want to make a real looking map, you have to um, use many different layers and um, the, also the labeling is quite complicated with a normal vector-based uh, program. But finally, uh, since the year 2009, I um, found a technique. Um, I drew a, um, I made a few cities with the same style in Adobe Illustrator, and in 2010 also one with um, Inkscape, so to say the, the free version of Illustrator. And 
The problem was that my largest project in 2013, called Tarot, um, was still unfinished because the file got too large. There were too many la layers and labels, and it was um, quite impossible to continue the work in it. And I, I was looking for other solutions and had the idea, actually, of using the OpenStreetMap software in the future. But, um, yeah, of course, if you want to use the, this software for your own purposes, you have to uh, find many technical solutions and have to ha have some knowledge of how to do it. This is why I didn't um, start immediately with this. So now let's look at some uh, examples of what the other maps looked like. The first pictures you saw was the hand-drawn maps. Uh, now you see here um, one of the vector-based drawn maps that was created in Adobe Illustrator. It's a small fictional city with about 30 or 40,000 inhabitants. Um, then you have the still unfinished project I was talking about, a uh, uh, small impression about what the inner city looks like. Um, you can see if you look in detail, oh, I don't know if it's really visible on the, on the screen, but um, that, for example, the outlines of the roads are still missing. This is one thing that I already added uh, um, edit in the end when I, I was finishing the maps, so this is still missing here, for example. Another important evolution in my case was um, creating a, a website of presenting all the different um, urban geofiction projects, like cities that um, are not existing and it's not, my own, not only my own projects, but also projects from many other people. And uh, all of them have, have in common that they like to draw fictional maps of not existing cities. So here you can see a short impression of, uh, of a British guy that made, um, who made a city called Pincher, I think. And you can see the names of all the projects at the top of the page. Um, at this point, I pass the word to Thilo, who will continue with his own uh, um, history of making fictional maps. Okay, that, that, that history will uh, lead us directly to the Open Geofiction project, as it is now. I, too, uh, started uh, drawing fictional maps uh, when I was a child. This is actually one of the oldest uh, surviving examples. You can see a, a big city uh, at the bottom left and uh, some smaller <coughs> cities nearby. Um, okay, those, those maps uh, became gradually became more detailed, become, became more uh, resembling uh, printed maps. And finally, uh, I created a, I created a, a set of, uh, consisting of 58 sheets depicting a, a whole country. Uh, do we have, yeah, that's, that's an image of it. These are actually uh, 58 uh, pages in A4 format uh, stitched together. So uh, that was 20 years ago, and then I stopped because I didn't have the time anymore, and uh, it became it became too cumbersome to to uh, to draw all this by hand. And I began thinking uh, maybe uh, this could be this could be done better with, with a computer. And so I was looking, initially I thought of, of programming the, the necessary tools myself, but uh, uh, that, that uh, didn't come around. So uh, then, those, then those virtual groups like uh, Google Earth began to appear. I created a, I, I looked, take a, took a look back at, at my uh, maps on paper. I created a digital elevation uh, model for it to display it in, uh, uh, not in Google Earth, but in, in uh, NASA WorldWind, which is some similar application. And then uh, I finally I became aware of OpenStreetMap. And uh, the day I, I was always uh, interested, the maps I was interested the most in were, were topographical maps with a large scale. And the day when I saw the first building mapped in OpenStreetMap, that was the day that, when I thought uh, this this might this could be a tool for my purposes, and then 
then uh, something else happened. I uh, discovered the website of Johannes and saw that uh, a lot of other people were doing this. And uh, so, okay, uh, OpenStreetMap, it might be not only a tool for drawing maps, it might be a way to, to make a community project out of this. And uh, so, so I thought, okay, uh, let's install it and uh, see, see if I can do something with it. And let's install it on my Windows laptop. And that uh, ultimately that failed. Um, you, you can install you can install the web application in the database. That's no problem. But uh, if, if you want to actually render the map, it gets difficult. So the next next uh, next try was in a VMware in a virtual environment which I had running by November 2012. And a month later, actually, uh, I, our, our first uh, server, our real server was, was up and running and uh, was for nearly a year uh, only used by me and Johannes. And then finally, in September 2013, we uh, had it open to the public. And then, uh, Actually, on the first day, uh, most, most people from Johannes' website did sign up. And then in, uh, in November, early November, we had a lot, a lot of sign-ups because uh, it was featured on a website named Popular Science. There was an article about it. And on uh, Reddit, there's, there's a world-building subreddit. Most of those are interested in, in more in fantasy, in Tolkien-style maps. But so, so we had we had a lot of signups actually by November, and now uh, I think now it's the place to to uh, to tell you something about our participation mode. Uh, this is uh, this is the overview map of our fictional world after the first day. You can see that uh, we are really it's called open geofiction, but we are not quite as open as OpenStreetMap. Anybody can sign up. That's no problem, but there's, uh, there are uh, different areas. Uh, I don't know if it's if if you can uh, uh, if you can really see it, but the continents are divided in lots of small territories, and uh, uh, there are different kinds of territories. The green territories are still free for new users to select. Then the orange territories are already selected. Uh, by, by a user, and then are blue areas uh, which are free for all to edit. So, and the gray area is reserved for future use. So this is uh, after our first day, uh, after going live, uh, everything uh, was, was green, a few, a few orange territories, and, and by early November, just, just during a week, it all changed from green to orange. And then we had a problem because there was no no room for uh, no room for new users anymore. We uh, actually, as a free free territories, became kind of scarce. But the problem was most of those users who had signed up weren't actually doing anything. They signed up, wrote us an email, please, can I have territory 150? Okay, the territory was assigned. Nothing happened. So uh, we had to we had to implement uh, a, a withdrawal process to actually retract territories from the users, and uh, and I had planned to 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 alleviate the the uh, most the, the current shortage to draw a new continent, which uh, had had its own problems. So uh, Finally, uh, in February, we had our first round of territory retractions, and by the end of June, we will have we will have another. Uh, this is this is uh, the state of territories as it uh, as it is now. There's a uh, in between. It had been all orange. Now, uh, 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 quite a few territory ter territories have become green again. And there are also a new color is yellow. 
those are, that are those uh, who will be withdrawn soon. Uh, okay, here again are participation terms, but I think I, I, uh, I told most of them already. Uh, but uh, one thing I should say, it's uh, the participation modes are still evolving. There are uh, territory, territories owned by single users and territories that are free for all and somewhat in between there are some territories where uh, some community projects are developing and uh, that's, that's actually still evolving. <coughs> Okay, uh, some words about the uh, technical architecture. Of course, we have a Postgres da database, uh, the Rails port of OpenStreetMap running on Apache and Mod Passenger, Osmosis and OSM to PJSQL for uh, diff exports running every five minutes, and then Mapnik, uh, Mod Tile, and Render Daemon for rendering. And of course, uh, OSM Coastline which runs every four hours, and everything is, is running on a single virtual server with eight gigabytes of RAM. Uh, that, that is uh, since, since our last server migration in March. <coughs> before, we had only two gigabytes of RAM, and that was sometimes uh, we... I hadn't figured out the, the diff export, so we did an export of the whole database and import of, into the rendering database every two hours, and that was that that did actually sometimes fail. Okay, some some numbers of about our project. Uh, it's you can see it's it's still a fairly small project. Recently, I, I uh, read that OpenStreetMap uh, had uh, now it's uh, one and a, one and a half million users. And at that moment, I thought, oh, okay, they, they have as many users as we have nodes in our database. But actually, that uh, wasn't, we had, we had already some more, but not that much. Okay, at the moment, we have uh, 400, around 400 registered users, but uh, only 40 of them are really active. On average now, we have uh, one, one sign-up per day, but most of them are still, uh, we, we somehow, um, we, we had to change, we had to change uh, our mode of territory assigning. In the beginning, everyone who signed up, uh, he, he got a territory right away, but now uh, we, we had to stop that, and now uh, new users have to wait two weeks, so that those, those users who do anything so, so I don't have to administer territories for users who don't do anything. Okay, and the other thing, I, I uh, it's still planned to draw a new uh, continent. Um, I did it with a graphics program, converted at that to a, to a OSM file, and then I, I wanted to uh, open it in JOSM and import it, and it looked like this. And that's, that's, that's because it goes over the new continent, it goes over the 180 degree uh, meridian, and uh, JOSM cannot do this. And uh, it's not only JOSM, it's, it's, it's OpenStreetMap ca cannot, apparently cannot do it. As you can see here, I don't know if it's really visible, but if you look at Alaska and Eastern Siberia, you can see that there's a straight line running between Alaska and Canada. And that's actually the, the US-Canada uh, border. And also, but also on the other side in Siberia, there's also a straight vertical line, uh, which is not a boundary, it's an artifact. So uh, that, that was actually a problem when, when I started to draw a new continent. And you, you, you can't, how to fix this? You can try to fix the software, but obviously the better solution is move the 180 degree meridian. So uh, shift shift all the meridians by, by 11 degrees, and then you don't have that problem anymore. So uh, that's actually, that's, that's what we did in that situation. And if, if you want to do it, uh, here's, here's, how, how, here's what you have to do. 
just log into the SQL uh, database and run run a few commands, <coughs> update the nodes, and uh, just just change the longitude value. Okay, and now I'm giving again to Johannes. Yeah, thank you, Tilo. Um, we're gonna present just very sh uh, shortly um, some advantages and some drawbacks of using the, USM, uh, the OSM software for our purpose. Um, of course, using the OSM software was very good to um, create, for creating a fictional, um, or for creating a collaborative um, community for um, creating fictional maps. And also when you use something like um, OpenStreetMap, uh, there's no need to decide beforehand uh, in which scale you want to draw or what map style you want to use because everything um, like, like scale and map style can be changed afterwards. Um, one other thing is that the map will never be finished. I mean, even if one day the whole uh, fictional world is drawn and up to a, a certain um, scale and level of detail, you can always add more details. That's actually the same thing as with OpenStreetMap, I think. So this is the advantages, but there are some drawbacks too, because all the um, OSM editors are generally made for um, copying from aerial images or from uh, GPS data. And this is, uh, of course, what we can't do with a fictional world. So this is a, like, um, a, yeah, a huge difference between our use of it and the OSM use. And it's also very hard uh, to get the sizes of objects right. This is actually what the problem is when you have uh, all the freedoms in scale um, of the map, that it's very hard to find um, the right sizes of, of the objects. Um, and also um, on the um, pro map projection used on OpenStreetMap on all the ed editors, um, you have a different size depending on the latitude. This also um, a bit complicated for some new users to um, understand this uh, difference in scale on the same zoom level, for example. And if you wish to draw large scale objects, you might wish to use your graphics tablet which uh, many of the uh, geofictional uh, um, members like to do is like um, really draw something in detail on the graphics tablet. It's, it's impossible with the um, current editors that exist. And then one other thing is that terrain or elevation is not handled by OpenStreetMap at all. This is an important thing for, um, for Tilo um, because as you saw in the beginning, he uh, really likes to draw topographical maps where um, the, the um, elevation is visible. So this is um, actually one, one of the things we want to do in the future. Um, we want to develop a method uh, of creating uh, terrain information. But another thing is that additionally to our map um, website, we want to create a Wikipedia style encyclopedia um, to add information, written information, or like um, picture information to the maps, which might be interesting for uh, our purpose. And of course, we want to add new continents because there's much free space on our world um, uh, up until today. So this was our presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention and your interest uh, in our subject. And if you're interested in the project, just visit, visit www.opengeofiction.net or contact us at info at opengeofiction.net. And if we have two more minutes, maybe I want to um, go into the website and zoom around a little and show you some examples of, of what the fictional places are looking like. So this is what the website looks like. Um, I can zoom out a little that you see um, that there's still much place left for a new continent. And then we're gonna zoom, I think, uh, show two examples, one of Tilo's maps and one of my maps, and then 
a third example of a collaborative city, maybe. So this is the country, actually, that um, Thilo developed um, like 20 years ago, and then like two years or three years ago put it into um, OpenStreetMap, uh, Open Geofiction. This is what it looks like now. So you can see it's, uh, our default style is the OSM Mapnik style. This is what it looks like, but we also have the possibility to change some la layers. So we have the open topo map layer, which is also quite interesting, especially for Tilo's country. It takes a moment to, to uh, load, and uh, I hope that it's going to work. Um, yeah, it's coming. So this is another map style. Very interesting that you can see your own fictional map in many, many different map styles, and That's then awesome. also um, the hand-drawn layer. Yeah, just one short look into the most interesting city I think that we have so far. I, I don't, go, I'm not going to show my my own cities because there's not the time for it but we're going to have some impressions of the city of Kaivun, which is here. And it's actually a very interesting project because it was <laughs> drawn by many different people, the same city. So this is what it looks like. If you go into the details, you can see that it's already drawn up to a quite high level of detail. If the maps are loading, you can see it. So this is what one of our fictional cities look like. So if you're interested, <coughs> just visit uh, opengeofiction.net. Maybe you are also interested in participating. And if you think that in your uh, town or city um, there's nothing left to draw in OpenStreetMap, <laughs> Just switch to our project and continue with fictional places, maybe. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. All right, so we, have, we take five minutes for, of questions because we're a little bit late. So, would it be technical, technically possible to create not a separate continent, but any number of separate worlds? A number of separate worlds? Yeah, totally independent separate worlds. Yeah, of course. I mean, do you want to answer this? I mean, it's, uh, of course it's technically possible, but this means that you have several worlds and you would have to develop several worlds um, and you would have to have the space in the database. I mean, do you want to answer more, more details to this? Or? No, it's, it's completely possible. It, also, it only depends on the um, size of the server you have. So. Um, have you noticed people mapping um, anything in particular that's interesting? For example, I've Personally, on Open Geofiction, found the ferry routes very interesting, and I wondered if there's different objects to OpenStreetMap that people map. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Um, have you noticed um, the objects that people map? Do they differ on Open Geofiction to OpenStreetMap? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, people normally start with a smaller level of detail. And they put the, most people put the different types of roads first and maybe railways. Um, there are only some people who start on the different uh, direction, really start with a very detailed place, like also mapping the buildings. Um, there are um, many objects or many things that are not mapped in uh, an open geofiction so far. It's like shopping malls with the names of it. It's the hotels. I mean, it's also um, many people start to do this, but uh, 
in the beginning, all the general um, topographical features um, like uh, rivers and streets and, and railways um, are the, the interesting things. I think this is what you can say, yeah. I'm sorry if I missed that, but other territories uh, corresponding to actual fictional stories like Middle Earth? No, they are not. No. Um, there's one important thing that I think um, I mentioned it, that um, in our world um, there are existing like the real uh, physical laws that we have in our world, so this doesn't really correspond to, the fantasy, to some fantasy mapping projects like um, this um, Middle Earth type. So, but um, on the other hand, if there are um, cities, fictional cities, um, or if anybody already has a fictional city project, um, or wants to integrate one of a, a fictional city to our project, it's, uh, he's very, very welcome to do so. I mean, uh, it can be like the Gotham City, if anybody says that I want to have Gotham City there, maybe we can include it, we can just see, but we, at the moment we don't have any of these projects included into our, our um, fictional world. Thanks. And uh, uh, other way around, are there some stories popping up uh, taking place in some of fictional cities that are drawn? Uh, well, this is uh, one important point where we want to use the encyclo um, encyclopedia for. It's like when you um, draw a map, then uh, first only in your own head, but maybe later in the heads of other people there are popping up stories about this place. And this would be a good place to write, um, write down such stories. Um, on the other way around, there, was one, uh, there were two people writing a zombie novel um, in the US, and they wanted to have a, um, a city for their novel. And uh, they asked us um, if we could just draw a small uh, US college town for their purposes. So this is what I finally did in one of the blue areas that you saw on the map, which are free to use for any, for any users. So this is um, how the stories are coming into the, into the thing. And last question about uh, that blue area that's uh, openly editable. Uh, have you explored what happens there? So is there some chaotic mapping or some communities uh, rising? Uh, Actually, I think um, the, mo the, the biggest problem with the blue area was that in the beginning no one was using it b because everybody got his own territory right away in the first day. So um, only when we changed the, um, the system a bit of making the people wait two weeks and only have the right to draw in the blue areas until they get their own territory, there have been uh, popping up some new things in the, in the blue areas. Um, but I think it's, at the moment, it's not as chaotic as we thought it might become in one day. So hopefully it gets chaotic because this is actually what the blue areas are made for, that you can do whatever you want and that you also, in the really free blue areas, you also have the right to change anything that other users have made. But um, also we want to, um, or we would like to see that people respect um, the work of others. So this is like a test of how people interact with uh, each other. <laughs>